Hey, dickheads! We've got a special pink laser beam of truth to beam to your brain hole tonight. We are technically the Spin Ratters tonight, because we're going to be talking about Norman Spinrad's Journals of the Plague Years. And I have a special guest tonight who's going to help me break down this totally bonkers speculative fiction novel, short novel. Uh, with me tonight is Mark Conlon, who is a longtime journalist and activist in the San Diego area. Mark, say hi to the folks. Hi, this is Mark Gabrish Conlon, um, who from uh, 1994 to 2012 was editor, publisher, and principal writer for Zenger's News Magazine, a publication of alternative lifestyles, politics, media, culture, and health. Right, and so the, one of the reasons why I wanted Mark, of all people, to come here and talk about this book with me is that you did a lot of um, AIDS activism over the years in various ways, shapes, and forms that are also not traditional, but we can talk about that uh, throughout the interview. But also, uh, Mark is a special person to me because his husband performed my wedding 15 years ago tomorrow, which is... Um, Interesting. Yeah, that's my anniversary tomorrow. Okay, well, congratulations. Yeah, and, uh, and congratulations back to you, because uh, we finally gave you guys the right to get married in this state. So <laughs> I'm glad that finally was able to happen. Um, now, uh, your history with, uh, what were you doing uh, activism-wise when, uh, and this is important to this book, during the height of, of the AIDS crisis? Uh, I think I'll go back a little, uh, and, uh, first, uh, what I was, um, I came out definitively as gay in December 1982 at the age of 29, uh, which is a bit late, but, um, and I first heard of AIDS from one of the people in my former home in the San Francisco Bay Area whom I called with the news, and, uh, had the feeling that I had shown up at the party just as it was breaking up and everybody was leaving. Yeah, so it was like you told them, like, I'm coming out, and their response was, have you heard about this AIDS thing? <laughs> right. right. Oh, wow. So okay. um, Now, and I should mention, the reason why we're talking about AIDS is that is pretty much the subject of this book. If you, if you didn't know already, Journals of the Plague Wars is a speculative fiction novel about AIDS. But let's get back to Mark's story so we can set the table. And I must say that um, the fact that I hadn't been in the community before gave me, I think, a more detached uh, view about AIDS. It was obviously a catastrophe, but at the same time, I didn't have whole numbers of friends who were suddenly getting sick and dying mysteriously like uh, most gay men of my generation. And uh, therefore... I think I was uh, immune, it's an odd word to use in this context, to some of the hysteria that surrounded it initially and was able to be a bit more detached and look at the evidence. And I quickly came to the idea, well before I knew much about it, that the reports about how people were contracting AIDS, how they discovered they had it, uh, how they progressed clinically, uh, some of them dying within weeks of their diagnosis, others uh, lingering for years, that it was obvious to me that what was called AIDS was not just one thing. Right. That it, you know, it, it occurred to me fairly early on that it could not be a single disease with a single cause. Mm -hmm. And in April 1984, uh, AIDS was as I put it, politically proclaimed to be a single disease with a single cause. Mm -hmm. uh, Margaret Heckler, who was then Secretary of Health and Human Services under uh, Ronald Reagan, and who a year and a half before had run for Congress in Massachusetts as a Republican against Barney Frank and had gay-baited him, mm -hmm. uh, showed up at a press conference where she introduced a virologist named Robert Gallo, and the two of them essentially politically proclaimed uh, the virus now known as HIV to be the cause of AIDS. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I'd always had my doubts about that because I didn't think this would turn out to be just one thing. I thought it would 
you know, probably be something more like pneumonia, things that, um, you know, where there are plenty of different things that cause pneumonia and uh, plenty of different appropriate treatments, uh, plenty of different uh, courses by which the disease progresses. And uh, mm -hmm. it would be, it would turn out to be something that uh, did not fit the mold of an infectious disease. But once Margaret Heckler and Robert Gallo made their political proclamation, uh, all research into AIDS from any other perspective basically stopped. And uh, it was not until three years later in 1987 that a UC Berkeley virologist named Peter Duesberg published a paper where he questioned whether retroviruses, the type of virus HIV is, could cause any human disease, either cancer or AIDS. And um, so I became part of an organization originally called the Association to Revaluate AIDS, then uh, the San Diego chapter of HEAL, which stood for Health Education AIDS Liaison, which was an alternative AIDS organization founded in New York in the 1980s. And I ran the San Diego chapter of that group until about 2012. Right. And so this history and your involvement in this is is uh, something I've known about since I've known you for well more than a decade. Um, so that's obviously why I thought you were a good person to bring into this. But that's not it. That's not the only reason why I thought Mark Hahn was interesting. Mark is one of the best read people I know as well. Uh, we see each other often on the bus. Uh, when we're coming home from work and we both always have books and talk to each other about what each other is reading. But Mark is also a science fiction reader, um, an occasional dickhead, which is uh, um, important to us uh, because that's what our show is about. But also just a, like, a longtime science fiction reader and very knowledgeable. And I also knew that he had read Spinrad before. So when I read this book, I knew I wanted to get Mark's opinion and I knew I wanted to get Mark on here. So, um, what's your history with Spinrad? Uh, well, the book of his I'm most familiar with is The Iron Dream, which was his uh, speculative kind of counterfactual history of what would have happened if Adolf Hitler had left Germany after the failure of the Beer Hall Putsch, emigrated to the U.S., uh, become an illustrator for science fiction pulps, and then once he acquired enough of a command of English, started writing for them. Yeah. So, the bulk of the Iron Dream is the text of Hitler's final science fiction novel, The Lord of the Swastika, right? which <laughs> Spinrad intended deliberately as a parody of You Know What. Right. Well, you know, it's funny because, well, let's backtrack a little bit and talk about Spinrad because I realize there'll probably be some people that their interest in coming to this is, is um, wanting to hear a discussion about about AIDS through the lens of speculative fiction. They might not know who Norman Spinrad is. Norman Spinrad is an American science fiction writer. He now lives in France. Um, he has lived in France for a very long time, so he's an expat. He uh, is a politically radical science fiction writer who emerged during the uh, new wave of science fiction, uh, most notably kind of launched by Harlan Ellison's Dangerous Visions anthology. Um, so he was one of the kind of radical voices of 60s science fiction, and he launched on the scene with a series of anti-Vietnam novels, one called The Lord of Chaos, which was his first novel, and then one called Men in the Jungle, which was a totally bananas um, anti-Vietnam war novel, but it had, like, the, the villain eight babies and, like, all this crazy stuff in 1966. Around the same time, he most notably wrote, um, or he got a lot of attention for writing uh, one of my favorite episodes of the original series of Star Trek. Much like Harlan Ellison, Theodore Sturgeon, he got a chance to write for Star Trek, and he wrote the Doomsday Machine episode that had that big giant cone thing that was eating planets. Mm -hmm. and then they went, dun 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 That was, yeah, Spinrad wrote that. <laughs> and uh, But Spinrad has uh, been publishing since the 60s. He's been consistently in print, and he's one of the most confrontational science fiction authors. If you look at what the one Mark was talking about, The Iron Dream, that concept is very confrontational. But he also w was one of the first authors of this uh, new wave who got banned with uh, Bug, um, uh, Baron Bug 
Bug Jack Barron. Barron. Bug back. Bug Jack Barron. Barron, right? Which was banned in England. Um, <laughs> and uh, I have read that one. It, it is really good. I didn't see what all the hubbub was about <laughs> because, you know, looking back on it. Um, well, the British censors can get very weird. I love the fact that uh, in, early on in Moby Dick, uh, there is a sequence where Ishmael and Queequeg spend the night together in the same bed, and Ishmael says, you would almost have thought that I had been his wife. And I think it's hilarious that several generations of English professors have been industriously explaining to their classes that that passage does not mean what it obviously <laughs> means, and what the British censors of Melville's time were aware that it meant because they demanded that he cut it from the British version. Right. <laughs> That's funny. Well, see... Now you guys are getting an idea of why I wanted to have Mark on the podcast. We're going to have him back on Dickheads. I think uh, we're saving Galactic Pot Healer for you. Um, and uh, because uh, he's super knowledgeable about all things fiction, too. Uh, but, yeah, so Spinrad, he's just very confrontational writer. He considers himself an anarchist. He's said it a couple times. He's not the only science fiction writer who did that. Ursula Le Guin, also very famously... A, sci or a science fiction writer who is an anarchist. Um, and by the anarchist, I don't, I mean that he believes in a political anarchism similar to they had in Spain um, during the Spanish Civil War, something similar to that. He believes in syndicalism, I believe, um, anarcho syndicalism. But, um, and he's still out there. He's on Facebook. He posts from time to time. So you can follow him and, and he's still writing. He, a couple of years ago, had wrote a book called The Psalm of the Gun that uh, he could not get published anywhere because no, uh, it was just like this one. It was one that was considered so um, uh, confrontational that no one would touch it. And I don't even know what that's about. I just know the title is The Psalm of the Gun. And um, so maybe I can look into that because he may have, I think he might have self-published it as an ebook. Um, it might be out there. But anyways, that's just a little background on Spinrad. Um, he is uh, uh, just um, uh, uh, one that I uh, really enjoy. Uh, I originally discovered him because um, uh, author Cody Goodfellow um, had told me I really needed to read Spinrad. And then right, right after that, uh, my favorite author in the world, John Shirley, uh, told me I needed to read Men in the Jungle. And then that was it. I was down the rabbit hole with uh, Spinrad. So, okay, so this one, Journals of the Plague Years, is one that um, had been on my list for a long time, but I just recently um, picked it up. And uh, if I try to explain the plot to you, or read the, if you read the back cover synopsis, which is available on Goodreads and Amazon and such, um, it is totally um, crazy. This book is... Um, Written in the narrative structure is kind of written as a series of journal entries um, that supposedly were compiled. It says in the beginning of the book um, in Luna City in the year 2143. Um, and so what it has is it has a bunch of just different journal entries from four very four characters. Um, and uh, basically they have these letters. Now the, the title, Journals of the Plague Years, is a reference to um, a classic of literature, and I, I um, the Journal of the Plague Year, which was a novel that was written in 1722, Daniel Defoe, I believe. Daniel Defoe, the author of Robinson Crusoe. Right, and he wrote a, a novel about the bubonic plague. And it was supposedly based on... Uh, the actual career of his uncle, who was a doctor who was involved in uh, fighting an epidemic of plague that happened in London. Right. And so this title in itself is just is a, 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 a really deep cut literary reference. So that's where that comes from. And I just I, I, I was familiar with the book from um, college, but when I every time I would search for Journal of the Plague Year, Looking for Spinrad's one, I would see. I would see this one. Uh, I haven't read it, uh, but it sounds like you have, maybe. Um, uh, actually, I just looked it up for uh, our for session our tonight. Okay, yeah, and and yeah, it's it's interesting because um, 
You know, uh, Spin Red uh, definitely was a pulpster in the beginning. If you look at books like Lords of Cha uh, um, Agent of Chaos and Men in the Jungle, but um, it's it's clear that the man is um, is a deep thinker and he has a lot of knowledge. This book was very well thought out in that regard, and um, you could look at the description of the book and think that this is just like some kind of like six like new or um kind of like edgy like crazy sci-fi novel but um it is really um quite a deep thought out work of science fiction so um so one of the things so one of the characters is is described on the back cover as a sexual mercenary <laughs> right <laughs> there's a scientist who's devoted to um curing this plague, but this book is very much a product of the time in which it was written, and it was written when AIDS was at kind of the height of the crisis. I think he wrote it in 85, and so um, for those of you who are younger who don't remember that time, if you're thinking now, like, hey, Magic Johnson's had AIDS for 20 years, it was a very different time. Can we talk a little bit about the atmosphere that the time was written in and how different it was and how that kind of speaks to this novel? I don't know how you feel about that, but I think it really sets the tone, the dark tone of, of, of where the novel's going. Oh, definitely. In fact, reading the book kind of flashed me back to those early days when not much was known about uh, AIDS, uh, when it was this you know horrendous thing, when it was assumed... Um, on the basis of some highly faulty and speculative science that uh, everybody who contracted HIV would get AIDS and would die. Uh, and one of the things that annoys me about AIDS fiction in general, and, you know, coming, especially coming from a position that rejects the HIV model mm -hmm. anyway, um, and... Uh, if I might digress, what uh, what I believe AIDS is based on uh, the researches of alternative scientists like Peter Duisberg, David Rasnick, Stefan Lanka, and some of the other people uh, I actually presented uh, uh, in person uh, during the years I ran the HEAL group, uh, is that AIDS is a toxic breakdown of the immune system caused by overexposure to recreational and pharmaceutical drugs, um, including... Um, the antibiotics used to treat cla to treat classic sexually transmitted diseases, which is how it got linked to sex in the first place. Um, and also, especially in the third world, especially in Africa, uh, malnutrition, starvation, and other common conditions like malaria and cholera that are ubiquitous in those parts of the world and uh, got misdiagnosed as AIDS because, as one former health minister in Uganda said, that's where the money is. Right. Well, but but in that sense, and I'm not rejecting those ideas because I certainly followed a lot of what you were uh, doing back in the day about alternative AIDS research, and, and I definitely think that there is a lot to it in the sense that um, that the, the 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 accepted dogma of, of of AIDS research is something that just never got questioned. But at the time when this book was written. This was at the height of the of the crisis. So what Spinrad was looking at was looking a hundred years into the future and imagining what would be the reaction if people were basically afraid to have sex because um, this disease grew not just affecting um, the gay community but basically affecting everyone. And you have in this future a time where very few people actually have real sex to the point where they've renamed actual biological sex as um, sharing meat, which is really gross uh, way to explain it. And it's not just me being vegan. Like, uh, it's just a really gross way to explain it. But that basically in this book, people basically, they just, they have either have sex with machines and they don't really have sex with other people until they find out that they're infected. And once they're infected, it's like, Hoorah, let's go fuck everything, right? <laughs> and <laughs> so this is kind of the setup of the dystopia of this book. And I think that that is a interesting analogy for looking at how the community was dealing with AIDS, where it was most 
close to the core. You see what I'm saying? Or Right. Well, one of the things that struck me about the book is that uh, to create his fictional world, Spinrad ramped up uh, the mainstream view of AIDS to an absurd extreme. Yeah, he took it to 11. Yeah, that's what um, Taft would say. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I think he started at 11 and took it to 25. Yeah, that could be. Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is bonkers. This book is yeah. totally bonkers. In the book, The Plague... In a good way. In the book, The Plague, as it's described... Mm-hmm. They never, uh, he never uses the A word. Right. Uh, quite deliberately, I think. Yeah. And uh, in the book, it is described as... 100% communicable, mm. uh, which even the mainstream does not say about HIV. Right. Uh, the statistic I've seen is that uh, from one unprotected sexual encounter with an HIV-positive person, you have a 1 in 500 chance of contracting the infection. Mm. Uh, in Spinrad's novel, it's 1 in 1. Right. And... Uh, but I think what he was trying to do was make a statement about the fear that was felt in the community that was closest to the core of AIDS, and he was trying to get the mainstream to kind of understand what the people at the core of this were feeling. At least that seemed to me like what he was trying to do. I think that's uh, part of it, and also it was kind of interesting that he assumed mm-hmm. that uh, bisexuals would be the vectors by which AIDS would spread out of the gay community and into the so-called general population, uh, which caused a lot of us in the gay community to say, oh, we're not considered part of the general population. Right. Uh, but, um, you know, in fact, one of the principal arguments against the infectious theory of AIDS is that that didn't happen. Right. Uh, you have not, you know, AIDS remained localized in the gay community and among a handful of other so-called risk groups. So, you know, what what this novel is, is taking the mainstream view of AIDS and exaggerating the hell out of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, the plague is one-in-one communicable, universally fatal, uh, always follows the same course, which infectious diseases generally do. Uh, you know, variations depending on people's natural immunity and uh, the, you know, uh, kinds of lives they lead, in particular how much money they have and, you know, whether they're, you know, you know what kind of environment that puts them in. But, um, you know, it always follows the same course. Mm-hmm. And um, it was something that in 1988, which is the copyright date on the book, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of people believed – you know, was going to happen even though it hadn't. Mm-hmm. And fortunately, it hasn't. Yeah. But, uh, you know, this was something that a lot of people would, you know, there's a passing reference in uh, the book to the fear that even though the plague is not casually transmissible now, you have to have actual physical contact. It might develop into a form that would be airborne. That's why... uh one reason why the authorities are so intent on suppressing the counter virus the scientist in the book invents mm. to combat it, that they think that he's gone haywire and is actually has actually invented a worse version of the plague virus than the one that already existed. Mm-hmm. Which, by the way, um, in, in a kind of a very spinrad way, is spread by Our Lady of Love, who is um, in the book is is a woman who is sexually transmitting the cure by so like the idea is supposed to be that she's supposed to go out and like cure people by having sex with them which is a little bit of uh, a little male wish fulfillment that kind of made me uncomfortable reading it is one of the parts that i did not like about the book but um it it didn't distract me enough away from the book that um, that I didn't. I mean, I still liked it, but I just thought that was a little weird. Um, and even before she realizes that she's incubating the counter virus, the cure virus, yeah, she's doing that already. Right. And her stated goal is if the virus mutates in enough directions, uh, pretty soon 
it will mutate into forms that are non-lethal or totally harmless. Yeah, she's she's hoping just by having sex with enough people they can mutate the virus. And that is exactly what happened to the influenza epidemic of 1918-1919. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't that medical science figured out a way to combat the flu. It mm -hmm. was that uh, without the marvelously tra efficient transmission vectors of World War I, um, the flu virus itself started evolving because it is a dumb thing to do for a virus to kill off all of its hosts. Because if it does that, it can only survive if it infects new hosts before it kills the old ones. And so the reason that flu is now an incapacitating and annoying disease rather than a lethal one is the flu virus evolved because the strains that didn't kill their hosts spread more efficiently mm. than the ones that did. So I'm wondering how much of, of Spinrad's research into this book, it seems like he really did research disease vectors and those kinds of things to, to kind of come to put this book together. And um, for those who don't know, he had originally wrote this as a, um, this was a uh, outline for a novel that he ended up not writing because no one would buy the novel. And so the version that we have as a standalone book was originally published in a collection, um, but it was basically just an outline for what he had in mind. And then they just said, well, this is the, his, his agent said, this is a great outline, but I can't sell this book, <laughs> right? And eventually he did get it into print as a short novel because he decided that once it was out there, he didn't want to mess with it. Anymore. And I didn't know that until I came here tonight because the edition that I have is a reprint that is missing the afterword where he explains that. Right, right. Yeah, and he does he does explain that in the afterword of, of, my, of my copy. But um, he... Uh, yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's clear that he spent a lot of time thinking about this and the ramifications and the different ways that this could have gone. And, and I don't want anyone to think that this is just like like a fun, crazy, like, sci-fi novel. I think it's very well thought out. It's very, I mean, he's definitely trying to make a lot of really powerful points. And... Um, I think it's successful, but um, there there is a lot to consider here. Um, there, so there's also a character who's a, like a kind of like God fearing fundamentalist guy who's like a congressman who um, who's basically give, is given the job to. At one point, he basically makes the decision that he's they're going to blow up, they're going to nuke San Francisco, which has become this quarantine zone. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, where basically it's like one big orgy because everyone has the disease. Well, that's, that's, that's the decision he makes when he's worried that the scientist's virus uh, is, going is, to is actually a worse virus than the original one rather than the counter virus that will actually neutralize the original. No, that's part of it because at one point in the book that there is a character who makes a point of saying that a huge part of their market share <laughs> is – is selling vaccines around the country. Um, Not vaccines, but what are called pallies, which is short for palliatives, mm -hmm. and um, which was basically all they had to treat AIDS mm -hmm. uh, through the mid-1980s when Spinrad was conceiving this book, that you, mm -hmm. know, you, couldn't, uh, you couldn't actually address what they thought was causing AIDS. All they could do was uh, give people things that would make them feel better or would treat the opportunistic infections, but not, uh, the underlying condition. So, um, but in fact, yeah. that was, that part of the book was the one that impressed me the most because it's the one part that Spinrad really predicted correctly mm -hmm. that Let's go deeper there. Let's go deeper there. What I mean, how did what exactly did he did he nail there? Like and and like straight up, like That's I know you're scene, hitting at it. Yeah, this is the scene where the scientist uh, who has developed the cure and he's done it within a matter of days because he's realized he's infected himself. Mm -hmm. So he's going to use his last few days of. Uh, health to try and push himself to, to try to push himself to the limit to create 
uh, something that will stop the plague virus. And he does, and he is very proud of himself. He expects that he will be rewarded and acclaimed as a hero when this thing will be put out immediately and the plague will be over. And instead, the people from the drug company where he's working uh, shut it down and uh, set out to destroy all of his research, uh, the actual cultures in which he grew the virus, as well as all of his notes on it. And the reason is... They are making so much money selling the palliatives that they do not want uh, the cure to exist because then uh, they will be out of all that money. And that is basically what has happened to AIDS in the 1990s and since. That in the 1990s, between the uh, International AIDS Conference in Berlin in 1993 and the one in Vancouver in 1996, the Rhetoric from the AIDS establishment shifted. They no longer talked about finding a cure. Mm -hmm. What they talked about is, quote, making HIV a chronic manageable illness, unquote. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would get into arguments sometimes with people who would show up at the HEAL meetings with, you know, ideas that the government developed this as a conspiracy to knock off gay people, and that's why this virus is so weird and it behaves so differently from any other uh, known virus, and uh, or that the drug companies were developing it because they didn't like gay people or something. And I said, uh, let's put it this way. If you're a drug company, would you want to sell people one drug for three years? Or would you want to sell them three drugs for 30 years? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the people in charge of AIDS, the kind of uh, medical pharmaceutical complex, or as Dwight Eisenhower called it in his speech right after we talked about the military-industrial complex, he talked about something else called the scientific technological elite, which is what you really saw emerging and um, coming together uh, with AIDS, and it was like the military-industrial complex, this union of public and private interests to uh, deal with these situations in certain ways that would uh, maximize uh, the profits of private industry and keep the appropriations flowing by keeping everybody scared. Mm -hmm. So you have the situation where the drug companies spent enormous amounts of money developing not cures, for AIDS, but treatments, mm -hmm. things that could slow the growth of the virus that allegedly caused it, uh, but drugs that would be incredibly expensive and that you would have to take for the rest of your life. And uh, that is what Magic Johnson and these other people who have, you know, quote unquote, lived with HIV for uh, many years have been doing. They have been uh, taking these medications that um, supposedly will prolong their lives but will not cure them. They will have to take them until they die of presumably something else. And that was the one thing that Spinrad really nailed in this book, that he realized that this would become an enormous profit center for the pharmaceutical industry in particular and what Eisenhower called the scientific technological elite in general. And um, they would want to make the enormous amounts of money that could be made from uh, selling these drugs for to the same people for long periods of time, and also expanding the market, which was why uh, in the 2000s, the big push was AIDS in the third world, and particularly AIDS in Africa, where a lot, you know, at least according to uh, my view and that of the scientists that uh, I interviewed for my publication and presented at my meetings um, was actually the traditional uh, endemic diseases of Africa, like malaria and cholera, being renamed and essentially misdiagnosed as AIDS complications. Mm -hmm. And um, so the idea was uh, they felt that the market in um, the U.S. and the rest of the developed world was becoming saturated. And so they wanted to expand into the third world. And they kept doing this until the financial collapse in 2008, which 
meant all of a sudden that the people they had been relying on f- to pay for the drugs, for these people who couldn't pay for them, uh, mainly uh, governments and private philanthropies, all of a sudden had a lot less money. Mm-hmm. So the that point, the AIDS establishment figured, uh, we need to redirect our marketing efforts towards people who have money, towards people who have health insurance, towards people who, you know, have some way to pay for these drugs, even if they don't pay for them out of pocket and not, and uh, very few people who take them do. Uh, and that's when they came up with something called PrEP, which stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis and means selling anti-HIV drugs to people who are HIV negative. <laughs> and you have... They, did, uh, they don't even actually need it, or it's, it's the idea that the prevention they were trying right, to sell. Right, that if you... Yeah, that if you... That if you are HIV negative and you take these drugs, uh, you will not become HIV positive. The original impetus was to market these to HIV negative gay men who were in relationships with HIV positive partners. Uh, now it is advertised on television. There are offices uh, pushing this thing. There are billboards on the bus stations and whatnot saying, you know, uh, that you don't ever have to worry about getting HIV. Uh, if you take the HIV meds, before you get HIV. Mm-hmm. Now, you, these, uh, this, this book. Um, Our engineer is laughing at that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Larry laughs from time to time. Um, I was hoping. Well, uh, well let's let, let's get into this book overall. And um, I had a very you see because I come come at it basically with a lot less information about like the AIDS issue that, and, and well, I don't think I have a mainstream view of the AIDS issue compared to most people, partially because of the education I got from reading Zangers all the time, your magazine. Um, uh, <laughs> right. Um, uh, and you know, we can talk about that in a little bit about, uh, you know, kind of the controversies that are involved with that, because there's just, there's certainly a lot of people, on the AIDS community who uh, are not big fans uh, of, of uh, <laughs> <laughs> the views that you've taken uh, from time to time. I have uh, been accused of uh, putting out information that will kill people. Right. And, um, you know, uh, no stranger to confrontational uh, takes uh, is Mark Conlon uh, <laughs> sitting across from me. But, uh, Let's let's talk about this novel as a piece of confrontational speculative fiction. Um, It is a very challenging piece of work, and I see why the publishers were afraid to touch it. Um, How do you overall view Spinrad taking on the crisis? I know you say he nailed one part. He probably didn't get everything right. But overall, how did you feel reading this book as a complete work? Uh, well, for one thing, I'm you know rather surprised to hear that it that what we have is just an outline for something longer, and I'm not sure if the book would have been as successful as it is if he'd had the chance to write the full version he had in his head because yeah it's you know it the, 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 the thing is, is yeah the thing is so good as a fable that uh, it's hard to imagine a longer version adding anything but length. Yeah, and I think that's what he came to, is that when he went back and looked at it, he was like, oh, it's just fine the way that it is. And so if if anyone's listening to this that didn't actually read it, um, and it it is written kind of in the same style that uh, World War Z or World War Z, for those of you in the rest of the world, um, you know, uh, with the, the kind of like looking back journal entry form. And I think that really works in favor of the book because it can kind of take a, a, a helicopter or a high orbit view of the issue. And we get to see many different characters and many different um, aspects. And by the way, part of it takes place in San Diego and Tijuana uh, with our quote, sexual mercenary who is a foot soldier in the army of the living dead. 
uh, which um, he becomes infected. I guess he's part of the, in the book, there's uh, sex police that are supposed to stop people from having sex before they get thrown in the quarantine zone. And to me, if you start taking all these kind of weird elements, it sounds kind of goofy and it sounds like, uh, but it all works. And I think as an overall piece, I think Spinrad was um, doing something really, really, really daring. I'm kind of glad that, like you said, that he didn't sell the novel and, and, and eventually turn it into something bigger. Um, you know, he's one to write big, long, um, like I know Russian Spring I haven't read, but it's like an alternate history novel that's like 600 pages. And he can do that, you know, <laughs> um, if he wants to. So, um, and that's actually the next spin rat I planning, I'm planning on reading, but anyways, uh, I, I, I think overall it's, it's, um, it's a pretty good piece of work. Um, I don't know. Do you have any, like, I want to talk about, we're, we're not, we're not close to done, but let's, let's wrap up journals of the plague year and talk about AIDS and science fiction in general after okay. that. But let's, let's wrap up journals of the plague years. Uh, do you have any other comments you want to make about this particular book? I did f find myself wishing that he had added a fifth character and that is a member of the sex police. Oh Yeah. Because kind of like um, that, uh, like the like Christian Bale's character in Equilibrium. I don't know if you've seen that movie, um, uh, where he it's somebody who's like a part of the secret police who uh, it kind of gets their eyes open. Is that the kind of thing you're looking you for? You the granddaddy of all those Ray Bradbury's uh, Fahrenheit 451. Oh, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, what's his name? And what's um, Montag? Montag. Yeah. And Fahrenheit 451. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I think. Yeah. You're onto something there. That, that's a good. Larry, he's already part of the dickhead's uh, playbook. He's <laughs> he's rewriting the book and yeah. making suggestions. Um, <laughs> yeah, that would have been really interesting. I, yeah, it's surprising that he didn't have a character. Yeah, it was the, the one. Police. It was the one perspective that I thought he should have included that uh, I found missing. Yeah, I mean, I guess he was kind of trying to put some of their perspective from that congressman who was yeah. part of that. Like, you know, the idea of the, the character Walter Bigelow, who is running the entire government response to the plague mm -hmm. and is literally, thinking? literally looking for signs from God. You know, one of these people, it's like, you know, you have to worry and wonder how many people in the current government are actually behaving this way of, you know, seeing everything as either signs from Jesus or signs from Satan, you know, signs from Jesus pointing to what they should do, signs from Satan pointing to what they shouldn't. Uh, and you have to wonder how many of the people in government now have come through this evangelical Christian movement. And I'm thinking particularly of our current vice president, Mike Pence. Yeah. Yeah, do you think Big Lou was based off of a, a an actual politician at the time? Because uh, I tried to think about that, and I, I was not really. But I think he was, uh, you know, Supposed someone to... someone with Spinrad's background and his politics would have been aware of the rise of the moral majority and the Christian right in yeah. general. Uh, he would probably have at least some familiarity with their rhetoric, and uh, you know, once again, as with uh, the disease itself, he was ramping up. Uh, tendencies that already existed and um, exaggerating yeah. to clarify, I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I gave this book five stars, five out of, I'd give this book, uh, let's do it dickhead style. I would, I'd say I'd give this book five out of five sexual mercenaries. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure uh, how you would rate it, but um, for me, for whatever uh, things that I didn't like about it, there was enough, like, completely rad stuff and cool stuff that, um, and I really appreciated that, you know, you kind of have to take the book for its time when it was written. It was written in 1985, came out in 88, I believe, and then, you know, you, you kind of have to give it some leeway as far as he was writing based on what he knew at the time, you know. Uh, but, it, says it, it says it came out in 95. Well, no, this edition. It was oh, that edition. Yeah, it was originally published in a collection, um, mm. but the uh, and my stand copy, one edition was ninety five. My copy is even newer. Yeah, it was in. Um, I want to say the name of the collection was. He was published by Banta, 
and like Banta did a like um like a showcase for all the science fiction authors and it was collected in that. But I'm not sure what the title was, but yeah. So um but yeah, that's Journal of the Plague Years. Do you want to give it a star rating, Mark? Or uh <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, it was reading. It was an intense emotional experience for me because it brought me back to those years when, you know, nobody had much of an understanding of what AIDS was. It was just this catastrophe that had suddenly loosed itself on the gay male community, and uh, you know, few people uh, really knew much about it. I think there's some evidence to indicate that AIDS was. Uh, or what we have come to call AIDS was rampant in the United States uh, well before it was originally identified in 1981. Mm -hmm. And it... I think it makes it an important work of science fiction. It only, uh, yeah, it only, uh, that it only became noticeable. This is an argument by the British journalist Jad Adams in his book uh, that um, it only became noticeable when it started hitting Americans who had health insurance. Hmm. Uh, that before that, it was a disease of poor people who were locked out of the healthcare system. And Adams, being British, actually has to explain in his book that not everybody in America has health insurance. Right. <laughs> because he's writing for an audience where everybody does have health insurance and they don't consider it such a big deal. Mm -hmm. So, um, star rating? Uh you know, I'd say I say five stars. I like Norman Spinrad's work generally. Uh, I think, uh, as I said, it's probably better that he didn't get to expand this into a full novel because mm -hmm. it works very well in this very strict, compact, fast-moving form where he makes his points and nails them and moves on. Yeah, agreed. All right, so let's let's get a little general because when we when I first um, suggested this book to you and doing this podcast, you said that that you had um, thought of other instances of of AIDS in science fiction, and I know um, there's like um, there was a very fantastical type fantasy type novel that came out around the same time by Michael Bishop called Unicorn Mountain. I have not read it, but when I read this synopsis, it looked it seemed like that like there were unicorns and all kinds of weird stuff. But everyone tells me that that book is, a, is an AIDS allegory. I've had three different people suggest it to me. But um, but what, what what books were you thinking of? Uh, well, there's one whose author actually um, came to speak at our HEAL event. He was yes, based in Los book. Angeles, and that was the book Deprivers by Stephen Elliott Altman. Mm -hmm. He actually published two books on the subject, one of which was a novel that he wrote himself, and the other was a collection of um, short stories by writers whom he solicited and asked them to write in his universe. And the way he explained what the ground rules for his story would be is he sent them out a fictitious bulletin ostensibly from the Centers for Disease Control uh, explaining what this new disease was, and it was spread by physical contact, uh, not sexual contact, uh, a mere touch would be sufficient. And it its symptom was that you were deprived of one of your senses, sometimes temporarily, sometimes permanently, and there was no way to predict if you um, were infected which sense you would lose and for how long. Which, you know, now, like, one of the biggest um, horror novels of the year, just because of the recent Netflix movie is Bird Box. And we there is a big trend in horror novels recently to have um, sense apocalypse novels where either you lose your sight, you lose your hearing, or you're hunted because of sound. Or, you know, um, there's the Brian Allen Carr has a novel called Sip where these monsters drink your shadows. Uh, so <laughs> Deprivers is kind of... I read it when it came out um, because I saw him at one of your meetings. Um, and it, it, Deprivers is very much in that genre, but, or, but early on, but yeah, it's really good. Um, it's a, it's a pretty good book. At least I remember it to be, I read it when it came out. And so. he actually had a contact at, uh, the TNT network, 
uh, who, and was trying to get them to buy it as a miniseries, but... He was a little ahead of the game on that one. Right then, yeah. right then, just when he thought he had a deal, the uh, TNT Network closed down their entire original programming department. Yeah, well, he was a little ahead of the game of the whole miniseries thing. Mm-hmm. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, so, and then I think... Uh, didn't you mention something about William Burroughs had um, yeah I, like I remember reading rereading Naked Lunch in the 90s and thinking in a way that it seemed to have been a kind of pre-AIDS AIDS novel uh, the way Graham Greene's book The Quiet American was a pre-Vietnam War Vietnam novel mm-hmm. that uh, was written in 1955 but uh, seemed to anticipate all these stupid egomaniacal, insane attitudes that got the U.S. so deeply involved in Vietnam. And likewise, uh, Naked Lunch, which uh, among other things comes from a writer with an immense background in writing about drug abuse, Mm -hmm. uh, seemed to me to anticipate a lot of what AIDS materialized, and in particular what our groups were saying about it, that, you know, it's not an infectious disease. It's a toxic condition uh, that you don't just get it from having sex. You have to uh, make certain lifestyle choices. And, you know, given the writer this overall podcast is honoring most, uh, one of the most interesting things uh, I read about uh, pre-AIDS but anticipating AIDS from our perspective is the epilogue to Philip K. Dick's A Scanner Darkly, Mm. where he says, drug abuse is not a disease, it is a moral choice. That's a Mm. very controversial belief among a lot of people. Mm. It'll get a lot of arguments, but I remember citing that at some of the HEAL meetings, saying um, that, you know, these are not things that you are forced to do, although you may feel forced to do them because you've been doing them so long that your body has got used to them. Mm. And... Um, that you had to kind of step back and say, you know, what are you doing to yourself? And in uh, Dick's case, he listed all the friends who had done long-term damage to themselves from drugs, including himself. Mm-hmm. That's right. Well, uh, you know, I, I do, we'll, we'll get back to PKD in a little bit to close this out, but um, uh, another one that I thought of was uh, Sacrament by Clive Barker. Um, which is, was um, definitely a reaction to to AIDS, but a little bit more mainstream, a little less speculative. Uh, just that it's a book, it's a horror novel where the main character um, has has AIDS in a traditional sense. Uh, but that's one that's out there, um, and uh, you know. But but getting back to PKD for a little bit to, to kind of close this out, because um, he's the man of the hour. He's the he's the guy that uh, gathers us all together, in the sense of, um, and you know, Spinrad is one of those those authors who's a contemporary of Dick, and that's one of the reasons why I'm covering him here in this bonus episode. But it is interesting to think PKD died right before AIDS kind of took off in 1982. Um, uh, we definitely had the first diagnosis in 81, right? Um, where, where it became a thing. But if PKD had not died in 82, let's say we got another 10, 15 years of, of PKD fiction. I think it's reasonable to believe that he would address certain things. Like I always talk about, um, wondering how PKD would address climate change, for example. Um, and he did a little bit, um, in, in kind of global environmental issues, a little bit, mostly through the eyes of nuclear war. and But I'm wondering how you think PKD might have addressed the AIDS issue, and and do we think that Spinrad is pretty close to what he did? Because I think it's a little different from the way he would have done it. Um, at least in, a, in theory, because we can only go in theory since we obviously never got to see him do it. Uh, yeah, my, my off-the-top-of-my-head guess would it have you know, a Philip K. Dick journals of the plague years would have been a lot more conspiratorial. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, you know, instead of uh, Spinrad's book where the authority figure is basically screwing up. Yeah. And, you know, he's enthralled to these private interests who want to keep the disease going so they can make money off of it. 
and he's also enthralled to this religious craziness. And I think Dick would have made him more of an active participant in the conspiracy and, you know, made it a lot more evil and not just, not just capitalist greed, but something more sinister. Yeah. And I think, you know, on to what you were saying about like, um, you know, how we missed out on not having a character who was part of the sex police. I think, um, PKD probably would have had, um, some, I think the nature of the disease, um, would have been less clear in a PKD version. I think, um, whether you have the disease or not would be part of the mystery. Um, and I don't think it would be quite so out in the open is the way I think it would possibly happen, which might even be more frightening. Um, because something that's kind of set more in the time of when it's, it's first, uh, happening and you don't, you don't really know, but, uh, all right, Mark, we, we've gone almost an hour here talking about, um, uh, this awesome, uh, spin red book and this issue. Um, is there anything you want to leave people with some last thoughts, uh, about, you know, the issue, um, or the book in general? I mean, when we're talking about, uh, you know, we're talking about the invention of a scientific reality on the basis of very fragmentary evidence. For example, uh, one thing that uh, occurred to me is that the use of highly toxic drugs to treat people who merely tested HIV positive and did not have the disease uh, on the grounds that if they tested HIV positive, they were going to get the disease and they were going to die, was based on something called the multi-center AIDS cohort study, which didn't actually begin as an AIDS study at all. It began as a hepatitis B study uh, in the gay male community in the U.S. And uh, in order to study hepatitis B, they recruited the people who were more at, most at risk for it, which is uh, people who are highly um, sexually active, uh, frequently got the classic STDs, took a lot of antibiotics, also uh, used a lot of recreational drugs. And these are exactly the people that scientists like Peter Duesberg and David Rausnick said are at the most risk for AIDS as defined as a toxic condition rather than an infectious disease. So, uh, indeed, um, although you've mentioned Dick, uh, in some ways that this whole reality of what we think of as HIV and AIDS uh, was so perfectly created uh, on the basis of bits of fragmentary evidence and uh, some really sloppy science mm -hmm. that um, the writer I wish had lived long enough to write about AIDS is Jorge Luis Borges. Mm. That, you know, his whole idea, in fact, I, one of the heel meetings I actually read uh, Borges' Uh, story, Tlan Ukbar Orbis Tertius, about the whole idea that, uh, of how you create a world by describing it. Mm -hmm. And that in some ways is what the AIDS mainstream is to me. It's, you know, a whole world that has been created by describing it in ways that sound scientifically plausible, but if you look at them critically, really don't make a lot of sense. Hmm. Well, uh, yeah, that's, it's heavy, and you know, I I really wish we had gotten a Philip K. Dick book um, about it. I mean, he's he's my guy, uh, so obviously. But um, but I I do think that you know, speculative fiction, you know, at its heart, what we can do best is is look at these major events in our time in history and be able to you know, dial it to 11 and, and really tell interesting stories to exaggerate, to clarify. And I think that's what this novel does. But uh, on that note, uh, Mark, it was awesome having you on Dickheads for the first time, <laughs> uh, even if it's just a bonus episode. But um, we would definitely keep you in mind uh, for the future. And I know you, you've definitely, you made clear that Galactic Pot Healer is your favorite PKD, right? Uh, not necessarily my favorite, but the first one I ever read, and the one that really made an impression on me and, uh, you know, kind of zonked me into his worldview. Mm-hmm. Do you have any other PKD uh, works that are tops for you? 
Just for, uh, our, for our listeners? Well, I mentioned Iskander Darkly earlier. It's probably, you know, one of his best known, but, uh, you know, as I said, it, it, you know, it was kind of in the mix of my, uh, uh, you know, AIDS as fiction works, even though it predated the crisis because mm -hmm. Dick challenged the whole orthodoxy of drug use as a quote disease, unquote. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as I said, the, the ending of Scanner Darkly, the afterword he put on really, you know, was one of the texts that I cited in my meetings is, uh, you know, if, you know, an author's uh, take on this, it's quite different from the one we usually get from the mainstream. Yeah, and that, that, that was powerful because PKD, um, you know, he wasn't coming at it from not having knowledge of what, she, what he was speaking. He was a person who, you know, as evidence from his output of, of like 80,000 novels in the 60s, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. he was definitely cranking it out. Um, under under the influence, and he knew what he was talking about, and he often saw things in a non mainstream way, and and that's um, I think one of the th one of the gifts and, um, that science fiction gives us. So, on that yeah, I mean, when he uh, when he when I read the book A Maze of Death, uh, I was you know I enjoyed the novel, but didn't like the fact that it seemed to be a promotion of drug use, and then when I read A Scanner Dark, he's like, okay. He's on the right track now. <laughs> right. All right, uh, dickheads, thanks for joining us. Uh, as always, keep it paranoid. <laughs> Stay paranoid. Paranoid. Paranoid.